You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, my name is Mike McDaniel. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. You're watching a Bible answer. And since Memorial Day weekend of 2004, this program has been dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. We're indeed grateful to have three brethren with us today to serve as panelists to answer those questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. I'm Alan Webster. Uh, I'm editor of House to House, Heart to Heart, one of the directors of Polish in the Pulpit, an event held in the fall of each year for Churches of Christ and from all over the United States. And then I've uh, also been involved in training preachers for the last uh, year or so in a couple of our schools of preaching. Hello, I'm Tony Lawrence, and I am the preacher for the Church of Christ at Bobby Branch in McMinnville, Tennessee, and I'm very thankful to be here. Hello, I'm Jonathan Burns, and I'm the preacher for the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. Well, it's a delight to have these brethren mm -hmm. on with us this month. They had not been on with us before till last week, and uh, we're just grateful to have them. Now, Brother Lawrence has our first question today on a Bible answer. Why do Christians worship on Sunday and not Saturday? Brother Lawrence. That's a real good question and one that I think is valuable for us to uh, consider. Uh, if we're going to use some biblical terminology, we need to understand that Saturday is the seventh day and Sunday is the first day of the week. That's the way they will be addressed in the Bible and sometimes people get those ideas confused. When you start talking about Saturday or the seventh day or the Sabbath day, it was a day that was given to the Jews as a part of the covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, the text says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is explained when you get to chapter 23 and verse 11, Six days shalt thou do thy work, and on the seventh day shalt thou rest. Thine ox and thine ass may rest, the son of thy handmaid, and the stranger may be refreshed. The text is very clear that the purpose of the Sabbath day was a day of rest. It was not so much as a day of worship because those days were actually designated as feast days and other days in which people would go to the temple. We do understand that this was a time that was never given to the Gentiles. It was only given to the Jews. When one comes to the New Testament, the book of Colossians, as Paul was writing that predominantly Gentile congregation, he said to them in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or Sabbath days. And then he says in verse 17, Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That means that these days were not to be uh, used as judgment upon those who were Christians and those who were Gentiles. Several years ago, I had a discussion with a Sabbatarian who suggested to me that there was a difference between the moral law and the ceremonial law. And it was his contention that because the moral law was written on stones, that it was written with the finger of God, that it was to be permanent. And thus all the Ten Commandments were to be kept even throughout history and throughout time. And then I pointed him to what 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 says. He says, But if the ministration of death written and engraved on stones. That means that what Paul was describing there in 2 Corinthians 3 was that which was going to pass away. And so the Old Testament system of worship was never to be particularly on the Sabbath day, that was a day of rest, but it also was not bound upon those who were Gentiles. But someone says, well, where was the change then to worship on the first day of the week? I'll point you to John chapter 4 when Jesus met the woman at the well. 
and she asked about where a person must worship. She said, Our fathers said you ought to worship here in this mountain. The Jews say Jerusalem's where one ought to worship. And Jesus' response to her was, He said, The hour cometh when neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem you shall worship the Father. That means that worship was something that was going to be done not in a particular place, but it was going to be given as new directions. And someone might ask them, well, when did we begin to worship on the first day of the week? We have an approved example in the Bible. We find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 20 that the church assembled together to eat the Lord's Supper. They assembled together in one place. And in chapter 16, as he had given order to the churches of Galatia, he said, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store. So he ties together the assembly of partaking of the Lord's Supper and the giving of one's means and the income to be done on the first day of the week. We see that also practiced in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 as Paul came to meet with the brethren on the first day of the week when they met together to break bread. So the idea of our worshiping on the first day of the week is a part of a New Testament example that is bound upon Christians today. Thank you very much for that good question. Thank you, Brother Lawrence, for that good answer. And now to Brother Burns. What is the meaning of Maranatha? Maranatha. Brother Burns. We find this particular scene to be set in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. And I'm going to read it a little different, but it reads this way. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Jesus has come, or Jesus come. What we need to do is to evaluate the context of the ending of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. This, of course, is the ending chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. We think about it as simply just chapter 16, but it is much more than that. This entire book is a book written to Christians. And if you'll read this particular letter written to the church at Corinth, you will find that they are much like us. They were people with problems. There has never been a time, except in the very early days of man, very, very early days of man, that there were not problems. And it did not take long for problems to come into this world. But as you read through this book, you'll find a variety of problems that Paul is addressing that these people need to come to reality with and change in their lives. And at the end of this chapter, you read this beginning at verse 19, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute much in the Lord with the churches in thy house. All the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with a holy kiss, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. And thus, verse 22, the word at question. Then notice verses 23 and 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is a word that is of great interest to us because of what's happening at this chapter. I like to look at the end of this chapter as an area to tell us it's time to get real. It's time to see what's been said, see what God has said, and make true application to our lives. I want to take us in two different directions at the meaning of this word and at the implication of this word here in verse 22. Of course, the word means in this scene, the Lord come or the Lord has come. Number one, we can understand the context of this word, meaning it's time to get it right because God has come. Judgment has been brought into this world. Jesus has died upon the cross, and thus the blood of Jesus is accessible for mankind today. The blood of Christ should tell us that we need to respond to the, to the cause of Christ, to what Christ has done, to the sacrifice that has been made, and to what we can do. But number two, we need to recognize this word also is used in a variety of different ways as the Lord will come. Matter of fact, this is the way that this idea is expressed more in the New Testament in a variety of other verses. Three times in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, in chapter 3, in chapter 22. And then also this concept is found in James 5 verse 8 which reads, Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. 
In other words, if one, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, does not believe in the name of the Lord, it's time to get serious because he is accursed. When the Lord returns, if we are not obedient inside of Jesus Christ, we are accursed. Matter of fact, the book of Matthew says, we will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. And then this phrase kind of comes into play about Lord come or the Lord has come. In other words, the Lord is coming again. He was coming. He has going to come again. And we see that in this particular phrase of this because of what's happening in the context. The churches of Asia, they salute you. Aquila and Priscilla, the Lord's house there and all that's in their house. And this idea of growing in grace in verse 24, the love that Paul has of these brethren helps us understand what Paul was writing. This is a statement that enforces that Christ will come or has come, and it furnishes as a warning for us to really take note and get serious about our lives and what God has to say. I believe that word is of great resource and a great question for us today. Thank you very much. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. This tract has actually been written by Brother Webster. He writes many of our tracts that we offer here on the Bible Answer, including the correspondence course that we're offering today. The tract is entitled, What Responsibilities Do Members Have to Elders? Very important tract. Then we're offering our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible. If you request this course, we will send you lesson one if you will answer the questions after studying it with your Bible and send it back to us, we'll send you lesson two. We'll continue to do that through all eight lessons and if you finish the course, you will receive a certificate of completion. So if you'd like to have any of our free materials or to send us your question, just contact us. You may do so by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may reach us by means of our website. We want to encourage everyone to go to our website. All of our past programs are archived there for viewing. That's at www.abibleanswertv.org. You'll also see the link there to our YouTube channel, or you can search for it at A Bible Answer TV. Our programs are archived there as well, and the scripts are searchable on the YouTube channel. If you're looking for a particular question, you can search for it there. You can also email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net with your request, or you can call our toll free number 1 800 436 0463. In reading the, uh, the toll free number uh, last week and this week, I'm reminded of something, and, and she probably would not even want me to mention this, but I think I will. Recently, a dear friend of mine and of a Bible answer passed away in Atlanta, Georgia. Her name was Sister Joanne Hardman Powers Bradshaw. She was a friend of this program from day one, and uh, she helped support us so that we could provide that toll-free number to you in the very beginning in 2004, and she's been with this program all the way. We love her and appreciate her very much, and we at A Bible Answer will greatly miss Sister Bradshaw. Now back to our questions today to Brother Webster. The query says, please explain Jesus' prayer in John 17, 5. What is the glory of which he speaks? Brother Webster. Thank you for this question. The book of John is a favorite of many as it deals with many things from Jesus' life that we do not have recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. If you want to look at an overview of the book of John, the first 12 chapters deal with um, <clears throat> a few days. The chapters in the middle, chapters 13 through 17, deal with a few hours. And chapters 18 through 21 deal with a few weeks after Jesus' resurrection and his appearances to his disciples. That section in the middle from which this verse comes, John 17, 5, all occurred on the Thursday night before Jesus was arrested later that night and tried the next day. So you have these uh, chapters that deal give us a great deal of information about the last night that he was free on earth before 
he was arrested, condemned, and executed. Now, this section is often called, chapter 17 is often called, the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. It's also called his high priestly prayer because here you have the longest prayer recorded of Jesus in the New Testament. Now, no doubt he prayed longer at times. Luke 6, 12, he prayed all night, but we don't know what he prayed about. But here we have a record of his prayer. The first part of his prayer, verses 1 through 5, has to do with praying to his father about himself. And then he's going to pray about his disciples, and then he'll pray about the world. But in this section, when he prays about himself, we find the, the verse that we're being asked about. So let's read the verse together. John 17, 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In order to appreciate this question, we need to understand the eternality of Jesus, we need to understand His deity, His humanity, and His reality. Now, Jesus came to the earth. He was known, of course, as Jesus. But before that, He was known in all eternity as the Word. John, at the beginning of this book, explains that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14, the Word became flesh, that is, deity became humanity. We know that because John 1, 1, the first verse of the book, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's a reference to the pre-incarnate state of Jesus. That is, uh, Philippians 2, 6 says, He thought it not robbery to be equal with God in the King James Version. That, that verse means that Jesus was what God was. That is, that He was of the same nature as God the Father and God the Spirit. God the Father is omniscient, omnipotent, He is omnipresent, and so the Son had all those attributes. But He gave up some of His divine prerogatives to become a man. We know that because, for instance, He gave up His omnipresence, which means to be present everywhere at the same time. When He became a man, He was located in a human body. He was in a manger in Bethlehem. He was in Nazareth. When He was in Nazareth, He was not in Jerusalem. When Jesus was in a ship, he was not in the temple. Jesus was located. So he had given up some of his divine prerogatives. Another thing that he had given up when he came to earth was his glory, his majesty. He came unto his own, and his own knew him not. Not only did they not know him, they didn't receive him. So here is the creator of the world, and the one who made the world, has entered the world, and the inhabitants of the world do not know Him, do not recognize Him. And they thought He was just a carpenter from Nazareth. They thought He was just an itinerant preacher going from village to village, city to city, and preaching. And many of them rejected His claims that He was more than that, that He was the Son of God. Now, when Jesus came to earth, He became a man. What does that mean? How can we relate to that? What is the step down from, from deity to humanity what would that be like? Well, let's go in the other direction. What if we became something less than what we are? Let's say we became a child. You know, now that we have had our freedom, we've, we, we understand the world in different terms, and we go back in time and we become a, a three-year-old or a two-year-old. Well, that would be a step backward, but we would still be of the same nature. Well, what if a man became a pet? We became a bird or a dog or a cat. That would be another step down, but nowhere near the same step down from deity to humanity. Maybe the closest that we could uh, relate to would be if we became a roach or a spider, something that's despised, something that ha is limited in its ability to, to do the things that we are accustomed to doing. And yet that would not be the same step down anywhere near it as stepping down from heaven to earth, from deity to humanity. So Jesus gave up His glory. Now what does that mean though? We have a glimpse behind the curtain a couple of times in Matthew 17, 1 through 5 at the Transfiguration. The Bible says that there were three, uh, Peter, James, and John, who were allowed to see Jesus, we might say, without His mask. He, uh, his face shone as bright as the sun, His clothes or bright as the light, Matthew says. And so just for a moment, they saw His real glory. 
If you go back to the Old Testament, in the day that King Isaiah died, Isaiah received a vision of God in his temple. And his train filled the temple. And there, there you have the uh, cherubim who are um, praising God constantly, saying one to another, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So they are giving the praises of God. And those were the praises of the Word as well as the Father. And he was used to having the praise of men, the praise of angels in his ears, but he came to earth and there was silence. They didn't know him. Or when they later when they figured out who he was or who he claimed to be, there were the curses of men instead of the praises of angels. He gave all of that up that He might be able to be our Savior, to be one of us, to experience life as we live it, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. Now, this is the last night before Jesus will be arrested, killed, and then ultimately ascend, ascend back to His Father. And you could say that Jesus is homesick on this night. He's thinking about what it used to be like. He's thinking about what He's about to step back into. And he's longing for it. He longs to be back of the glory that he had with his father before he came to earth. And this verse helps us to appreciate, in a different way perhaps, what Jesus gave up that we might be saved. He gave up a lot for us. He did not come just for a day for a visit. He didn't come just for a week, like we might go to camp or go on a mission trip somewhere, humanitarian aid trip. No, he came to be one of us and live for three decades, more than three decades among us, to show us how to live and then to die in our place. Thank you for the question. Well, thank you. That's such a thought-provoking and deep question, isn't it? And it brings to mind the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He were rich, what all is involved in that? Beyond our mind to contemplate, isn't it? Though He were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich what a powerful statement that is to brother lawrence what steps must be taken to go to heaven brother lawrence well this is the question i've been waiting for all the other questions have been sort of difficult but this is the one where a person can really uh, appreciate the great profound nature of it because if a person is going to make it to heaven it's going to be because a person wants to go there we go in Matthew chapter 7 and look at verses 13 and 14 and he talks about entering the narrow and the straight way and avoiding the broad and wide way that leads to destruction in the parallel passage of Luke chapter uh, 13 and verse 24, he says, strive to enter. The word strive there is from the word agonizomai, agony. Put some effort into it. Put some diligence into it. If I'm going to go to heaven, it's going to be because I follow some steps that God has placed there for me. When Jesus in John chapter 14 talked about returning to the Father. He said in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Notice that he says, I am the way. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we study through the Scriptures, we realize that there are several steps that one must take. And the best way that I can present that to someone is to take them to the book of Acts and to go through each of the accounts of conversion that are there. And obviously, for the sake of time this today, we're not going to be able to look at them individually, but simply to point out that you begin by noticing in each and every case that a person had to have faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. And so each of them were instructed to have faith or they demonstrated they had faith. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. From that, people were required to repent of their sins. That's something that Paul told the Athenians 
in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. That's what Peter taught the people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. When we read about the conversion of the eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He made that good confession. He stated his belief and was doing exactly what the Lord taught that a man must do. And then to be baptized, to be immersed in water for the remission of sins. We can see that in such passages as Acts chapter 2 verse 38 or as Paul was told to do in Acts 22 and verse 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Each of those are steps that a person must take if they're going to enter into the Lord, and then from that point forward, they must continue to walk with the Lord, to walk in the light as He is in the light, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, to attempt to avoid sin, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. But then a person living faithfully has the confidence and the hope of being able to spend eternity in heaven with God and the redeemed of all the ages. Thank you for that great question. Thank you very much to Brother Webster and Brother Lawrence. Brother Burns for doing such a great job again today on a Bible answer. We appreciate their study. We appreciate their efforts so very much. You know, when I think about that last question, it's such an important question. I would just invite everybody, as, as he said, turning to the book of Acts. Why don't you just take a look at the cases of conversion in the book of Acts? And I did this one time. Make a chart. Make a chart of what occurs at each case of conversion. And friend, if you will do that in an honest way, you'll find out the gospel plan of salvation that Jesus has set forth. Because it's readily apparent as you study each case of conversion in the book of Acts. I think you would be interested to see what steps are included in every case of conversion set forth. The fact of the matter is that one step that is often neglected, one step that is often said to be non-essential or unessential is in fact there in every single case. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer and remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.